So reflex lab. First thing we're gonna do is this reflex lab. You know, it's the stuff we started last class. Um, we're gonna actually look at the results for that part one. And you can then figure, you know, write up the rest of your write up for that. We're also gonna look at a variety of different reflexes that are usually part of neurological exams. Um, you know, I'll talk through them briefly, although most of what you're gonna do for your write-up is gonna be watching little videos and describing things that you see and answering questions about them. So that's gonna be the first part. Now, obviously you've noticed we've shifted things around a little bit. Um, we are gonna do this general sensation lab, which is actually stuff you do mainly at home. And I am going to talk you through kind of what you're going to be doing and giving you just a few um, a few pieces of advice as you head into it, you know, kind of common mistakes people make or things to think about. But this actually should be kind of fun. Hopefully, you've got somebody you can like poke at with a paper clip or something and record their results. Or, um, or you, get, you get to draw on them as well. You get to do all sorts of fun things. Um, so we will talk about this. And then we're going to introduce the nerve stimulation lab. This is the one we're doing next week. It was originally supposed to be scheduled for today but I didn't wanna jump into it without more background. Um, general sensation lab, we don't need a lot of background. We can just dive into that one. But the nerve stimulation lab, we really need to talk about what the objective is. What are the independent and dependent variables? How are we actually measuring them? Because just from reading them, it's not always so clear. Um, so I. I want to make sure we spend some time talking about this, making sure everybody is on track, and then you can do the pre-lab and have the pre-lab ready for this one. So on Tuesday, we can do it for real. But I, yeah, I think if we just dove into it today, it would not be as you know, useful pedagogically for people because people would be kind of lost rather than learning something. So, reflex lab, we're gonna start with the reflex lab. So at this point, pretty much everybody has done their, done their um, pre-labs. So what is the objective for part one of the reflex lab? Um, I wrote, will Gendrasic's maneuver have an effect on reflex strength? Yeah, so that's basically it. So notice, and notice she asked a question. I have started looking at some of these. There's still people who are putting these objectives in and they're not questions. It really should just be a question. Like what is the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable? Um, and I, mean, I can, here I, in fact, going on? Oh, wait a second. Oh, there it goes. Okay. I'm going to find my, there we go. And I'm gonna share. Okay, if I share my screen, this was the first week of class, the first lab. Um, you know, kind of reminding people that objective question, what is the question? And it's almost always like, is there a relationship 
between or a correlation between the independent and dependent variable? What is the relationship between the independent and the dependent variable? Or how is the dependent variable affected by the independent variable? Like people are still not doing that. Um, so when you're done with your objective, look at it and ask yourself, is it a simple question that queries the relationship between the independent and dependent variable? And like I've mentioned, I'll say again, it's a really good skill to have to really kind of get good at focusing in what exactly is the whole point? What am I asking? What do I, what do I want to know? What, why am I doing this? What's the, what's the information I would like? What's the question I'd like to answer? You know, just in life in general, when you set off on some project, you can get all caught up in the details. And sometimes you, it's good to step back and like, okay, wait a second. What is my real clearly stated objective? And then move on from that. Um, so just kind of putting that out there again. Um, so back to Nikki, though. She asked a nice question. And it was about Gendrasic's maneuver. How does Gendrasic's maneuver, you know, you know, affect, and you know, we could say size or magnitude. And if you wanted to be a little more explicit, it's not just any reflex. What kind of reflex are we looking at? Stretch reflex. Yes, yeah, stretch reflex. Oh yeah, so Ethan, William James, that, that is, yeah, William James was, he was a stud. He was amazing. Um, he, wrote, he wrote a number of books. He thought about a lot of things really deeply. And it's also kind of like a mix. It was back when scientists and philosophers were kind of the same thing. So he asked like a lot of interesting questions, but also does a lot of more hard science as well, trying to understand, but then thinks about it. Um, he was the brother of Henry James, who was a famous author. Um, so back here, stretch reflex. You know, and we look at two different stretch reflexes. So we have Gendrasics, and then we're going to be looking at the patellar reflex as well as the um, calcaneal tendon, Achilles tendon. So let's go and do it then. All right, I'm going to share. Right, you'll notice I changed. It said eight was nine. Yeah, so I, I, I flipped these around. Um, so reflex action lab, doing the reflex action lab. So what I am going to do is just show you this little video, which is just showing what the actual data gathering looked like, just so you have a sense. Um, and this is just like four minutes. Meet Google Fi, a phone plan by Google. With Fi, only pay for the data you use or go on. All right, and again, this idea is we're going to have to look at the magnitude of the reflex without Gendrasics, look at it with Gendrasics, and we're going to compare. If you read the procedure, you'll see this one actually involves trigonometry. You actually have to like put um, rulers on the you tape pieces of wood on the person so you can see the triangles that get made by the angles. Right, because when we think, of, in fact, maybe I should mention this idea of magnitude. Right, if you're a short person and you kick out, the actual distance you kick out might be a big kick, but it's not going to go as far if you have short legs. Whereas if you are like really tall, you might have a similar kick, but actually your foot goes out much farther just because the angles, I mean, because your leg is way longer. In fact, maybe I should just. 
right? Here's one person. Here's another person with a much longer leg. They might both kick out the same amount. But if I look at the distance that the foot moved, it moved a lot farther here than on this person. Um, so in order to kind of normalize that, we want to instead look at the angle. So then we can see how much did that angle, you know, actually we're going to look at the, the angle of, of the actual kick. We're going to assume we're at zero when the foot is just hanging down. And then we can calculate what How much do they you know so that way it normalizes. It doesn't matter if you have short legs or long legs. Um, it has to, we have this angle of the kick to measure the, the, the magnitude of the, the reflex. And you can just, just do it with you know for I think in <laughs> Yeah, I think in um, in order to, to get, because I'm giving you a lot of other stuff today as well with the um, general sensation. Sometimes I actually give people raw data and I have them calculate out the angles and everything so you get practice with that. Um, <clears throat> but I'm thinking, don't worry about it. You can just use the angles that are in the, the data sheets that I give you. So, Because it's yeah, I I think I think that's going to make sense. So I'll mention that again in a few moments. But this is what it looked like when we did it. All right. So we have our subject here all set up to take measurements. You can see the leg has the ruler taped onto it, and the ruler extends almost to the ground, but not quite. Obviously, you want it to swim freely, but on the ground, we have a meter stick. And we want to set it up so the stick is measuring right at zero when she's relaxed and her leg is hanging vertically. So I'll double check here. So now it's at zero. So as she kicks out, if I can even show as her leg kicks out, that angle of the line, you're going to have to kind of approximate where does that line meet the ruler here. And that would be this distance we're calling A. The distance from whatever pivot point to the ground, that's going to be the distance we're calling B. Um, and then obviously you can use those two to calculate the angle. So when you're going to do this, it takes a little while. You can go up and down the kneecap where that tibial tuberosity is and kind of play around, find that wasn't the right spot exactly. That was the right spot. <laughs> so you can see that and you can cut into a little piece of tape and make it easier to find again. Obviously, if you go and nothing happens, don't take that data as a zero. And spend a little bit of time seeing if you can get a consistent response before you actually start getting the data. So we can do this. So right now, my subject is sitting there relaxed. We're going to get kind of our baseline measurement of the magnitude. So I'm getting ready to go. And I'm also taking a look, shift my position here so I'll be able to see how this goes out. You probably don't see me here. I'm back to the camera. There we go. <laughs> and then we do three. So that went out like maybe nine centimeters. That's how I record that. Yeah. <laughs> About like seven and a half centimeters. And we'll do it one more turn. So, 
one went out more like 16 centimeters. Your subject is going to do Jendrasic's maneuver. So you can see she. Right. So normally you do three, three readings because each time you do it, it's going to be slightly different just depending on exactly how you hit, as well as even if the person's fighting you at all. I recommend that you try this, even though it's not necessary for your lab. If you've never done this on somebody, it's cool just to do it, to see that it works. You don't need to have a fancy little like reflex hammer. You could just use like a piece of wood or even use your hand um, karate chop. Um, the idea is you need to stretch out the patellar tendon, which is kind of that soft springy part right below the kneecap. Like if you're palpating, if you're feeling their kneecap and then you feel down the tibial tuberosity where the tendon or ligament attaches onto the top of the tibia, and then there's this kind of soft springy place below the kneecap above that bump on the top of your tibia, you'll feel it. It's kind of just, it gives. If you just whack on that part that gives, if the person is sitting and they're relaxed and they're not fighting you or anything, it's, or have someone do it to you, it's very kind of freaky because you're not moving your leg and your leg kicks out on its own. So if you've never done it, I recommend doing it because it's, you know, it's, it's in our pop culture of like hit someone on the knee and they kick out. Like you watch Bugs Bunny do that and get kicked in the face on a cartoon or something. But it's really fun to do on, on yourself or on somebody you know and see it for real. So this is Jendrasics. Here, Tina is pulling all her might. Is holding her or pulling her um, hands apart and she's going to hold that tension while we do the reflex. So we're going to do this again. And now she's in Jendrasics maneuver, coming in. Wow. So we saw there was definitely a stronger response there. That went out to maybe like 19 or so centimeters. Um, we're going to do one more time. Yeah, she's still pulling there. <laughs> That was probably like up to 21 centimeters. We'll do one more. That was another 19 centimeters. So there we got our data. We have three readings for the baseline, three readings for the gymnastics maneuver. We have to convert those into angles, we get the averages, and see what happens. All right. So Again, just to reiterate, you are not going to have to calculate all you'll have in the spreadsheet that I give you in a few moments, you'll have the angles. So don't, don't worry about the calculations. Um, but you could see even when we're just messing around like that, when she was doing gendrastics, you don't even have to measure to see how much more dramatic her response was there. Um, is this going to be a qualitative or quantitative analysis of her patellar tendon reflex? Qualitative. Quantitative. So we have one vote for qualitative, one for quantitative. How do you make it that? How do you make the call? What makes something qualitative versus quantitative data? If there's numbers involved? Yeah, if there's numbers. So is this going to be qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative. quantitative. It's quantitative because we're actually measuring an angle. And then we can see if the angle with gendrastics is larger or smaller than the angle without gendrastics. Qualitative is if you're just like, eh, it looks bigger or smaller. Um, so kind of comparative kind of things without numbers, that would be qualitative. But if we're actually measuring things and we can compare the numbers, the measurements, that's quantitative um, analysis. Um, what is the other stretch reflex we're going to be looking at? Okay, so we're going to test the The calcaneal. What's that? The calcaneal. 
the calcaneal reflex, right? So that's going to be similar, but it's going to be tapping on the Achilles tendon and watching the toes go out. So here I can show you a quick little thing of that. Um, here it is. Gymnastics maneuver. We have to convert those into angles, we get averages, and see that. Okay, so we're going to test the gen or sorry, the Achilles tendon uh, reflex. And so I will uh, aim right here. Right. Again, it's that soft spot between, like, I have my calf muscle, my gastrocnemius, and soleus into my Achilles tendon, attaching onto my calcaneus, the heel bone, you can find that springy place. So when you whack on that springy place, it stretches out the muscle, initiates the stretch reflex. My calf muscle contracts. When it pulls on my heel, my toes point out. If you want to try this at home on a, someone in your family, um, you can use, use your hand like kind of karate chop and get a similar reaction. And um, you want to try a Gen Jurassic maneuver? All right. Okay, so I'm not sure if that was uh, larger, but maybe. Yeah, I think that's less than what. Then that was Gen Jurassic. Make a difference. It's, it's hard to tell, but you can get a sense of, and again, you can mess around at home with somebody if you'd like, but you don't need to. Um, so what I have though is this class data. So basically in your write-up, what you need to do is this is a pretty, gonna be pretty simple for this part one. You have data for patellar without and with gendrastics in terms of the degrees that they kicked out. And then for Achilles with gendrastics, is it minus one less, zero the same, plus one more? You can see in general, people said it was plus one. It was more with gendrastics compared to without. You know, would this be qualitative or quantitative data here for the Achilles? Qualitative? Be qualitative, because I'm just saying, is it bigger or smaller or the same? You know, so this lab, we have quantitative data for the patellar tendon, and we have qualitative data for the Achilles tendon. But in both case, cases, you'll have information that you can then take back and see how it relates to your hypothesis. And again, if you want to mess around at home, I highly recommend you you do, but it's not necessary for your for your write up. For your write up, you just need to have this the data that is here on the module, have that in there, and then kind of fold that into your discussion how it addresses your hypothesis and what your final conclusions are around it. So that's part one. Part one is the stretch reflex with gendrastics. Any questions about part one? Okay, it should be relatively straightforward. Part two is demonstrations of various reflexes. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through these right now. I don't, there's no reason for us to watch them all together. And um, instead, I'm just gonna tell you a little about each one. And then after we're done, <clears throat> what you need to do is have your lab notebook opened in front of you, you know, and watch these. 
and you know describe what you see in the video as well as you know answer the questions about what it means. So this is just basically this is no no longer an objective or hypothesis. This is just about getting familiar with some um, common reflexes and what are normal or abnormal responses. Um, plantar reflex, you're basically um, pulling a um, blah, 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 blah. This on an infant less than 24 months. Uh, let me for a normal response. So you're basically taking a, you can either, could be like a, a stylus, a pencil, the back of one of those reflex hammers, you pull it up the bottom of the foot. Um, if it's a normal reflex, their toes curl in. Um, it's This one's a little trickier to actually make happen. So a normal response, plantar flexion, curling of the toes. If that is not happening, it means there's probably some motor pathway problems. Um, so if they do this on somebody and the toes don't curl in, that means there's an issue. Um, except if you're a baby. Um, if you're a newborn, they do this. They'll drag a stick under the, the sole of your foot. And if you're a baby, the plantar reflex is the opposite. Your toes actually flay out. Um, I should maybe say the word. Called Babinski's sign. So again, normally when you drag along the base of the foot with a stick, the toes will curl in. Babinski's sign is the toes curl out. You have a like dorsiflexion. That's normal in a baby. Again, this is part of like putting the newborn through its paces to make sure its nervous system seems like it's working right. Drag mm -hmm. a stick on the full of its foot, and make sure the toes go out. But if you're more than a year and a half old and that happens, that means there's some motor pathway problems. You know, so they think it has to do with like incomplete myelination of the motor pathways that, you know, cause the different reflex. So plantar, plantar just means the base of your foot. So the plantar reflex is dragging that stick along the bottom of your foot and watching what happens to your toes. Um, I should also just warn you, or I warn you, in her video, she claims to show like normal and abnormal plantar reflex, but it's clear that the person who's having the abnormal reflex is making it up. You know, sometimes you, you see videos and you actually have actual patients and you see actual stuff, it's kind of cool. This one, I put it in here because it's short and to the point but it's clear that you are acting. It's kind of like if somebody hits your knee and it's like, oh, let me kick out, you know, instead of actually letting it happen on its own. So it's, it's a, little, a little disappointing to see it, just to, yeah, to see that. But you'll see what it would look like if somebody had an abnormal plantar. Corneal reflex. This one is if you touch the front of your eye, the cornea is the clear window leading into your eyeball. What do you expect if the response to be if you stimulate touch receptors on the cornea on the surface of your eyeball? Your um, eyeball, will, your eye will try and close. Yeah, exactly. And your eyeball will look up or like to this, wherever it's not being touched. I think even before, there's nothing around looking. At some point, this is purely, I saw Ethan, Ethan acted out there. Um, yeah, if, if, if there's something touching your eyeball, you're probably going to want to shut your eyes and protect your eyes. Um, 
you know, when we do this in the lab, we do it with like a little wisp of cotton. So it's, you're not actually going to hurt somebody. There's no way a wisp of cotton is going to poke your eye out, unlike like a PB gun or something. But um, you will still, even from a very gentle stimulation, you can see a pretty dramatic Lincoln. So watch that. Answer the questions. Pupillary light. So this one, this one I wish we could do in person because it's cool. It's a little unexpected and there's no good videos of it, of real eyes. I think because it's really hard to get the lighting right. I looked quite a bit for real eyes to see this on YouTube and I didn't feel like trying to make it myself because it seemed enough people were having trouble doing it themselves. So I have this little computer graphic, which is going to make you understand what you would see, but you can do this at home with, with somebody if you wanna confirm the results because the results are a little non-intuitive if you've never thought about it. The basic idea of the pupillary reflex. You have a light and you shine it in. Normally, if you shine a light into your eye, what's going to happen to the pupil? It's going to dilate or go smaller. We get smaller. What's the word for getting smaller for the, the people? Constrict. It's going to constrict. Dilate? Well, not dilate, constrict. Yeah. yeah. In fact, maybe I should let me. Constrict. Can it get smaller? Dilate means to widen. Right, so if I have, here's like somebody with green eyes. Let's say there's their pupil normally. If they're constricting, their pupil is more like a pinpoint now. If it's dilating, it's more wide-eyed. Um, which division of the nervous system is going to mediate constriction of the pupil? Occipital. Motor. It's going to be motor. And what division of the motor? Autonomic. It's going to be autonomic because it's, it's smooth muscle that you're not controlling consciously. So it's autonomic in what subdivision of the autonomic even? Parasympathetic. Yes, parasympathetic, that rest and digest is going to be constricting the pupil. What about what division is going to mediate the dilation of your pupils? Sympathetic. Yeah, the sympathetic, the fight or flight. Um, and it widen the pupils, let more light in, see what's going on. Um, and again, I always think of like that kind of just the phrase like wide eyed with fright. You know, if somebody is terrified, their eyes are like saucers or whatever. Um, so sympathetic fight or flight is dilating. Parasympathetic autonomic is constricting. Um, so if you're going to shine a light in somebody's eye, what happens to your pupil? Constricts. Say that again. Constrict. 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 It's going to constrict. It's like if you're, if it, you know, it's kind of like shutting down the aperture on the camera. If it's getting super bright, you're going to have to like make the pole smaller so you don't have as much light getting in. Um, what happens to people that are like on drugs and their eyes are already dilated or already constricted? I mean, if. What if, happens when you shine the light in their eye? Right, different, different drugs do different things. It all, the psychedelics actually are pupil dilators. If you're like on mushrooms or acid or something, your pupils are gonna be really big. Um, opiates tend to make your pupils more like pinpoints. 
So diff different drugs are going to do different things, you know, and then the, the pupil is going to respond in whatever way it can. Um, it'll probably adjust a bit from whatever its baseline is at the moment. Um, I think it depends what drug you're on, how much you're on, all that. Um, so we shine a light and if I shine a light in one eye and that pupil constricts, what do I call that? Is that ipsilateral or contralateral? Ipsy. That'd be an ipsilateral. So an ipsilateral contraction makes sense. If I, sh in fact, just kind of, let me stop sharing here. The way this works actually is you put a block between your right and left eyes and you shine it just in one eye. So you, first you look, you measure the pupil size without any light coming in. Then you shine a light in and what do you expect? You can't even see my eye with the light here on the screen. What do you expect my pupil to look like in this eye? Constricted. Constricted, smaller than it was. What about the pupil in the eye that's not getting the light? What do you expect? It, it'll stay the same, right? Right, so that's that's one hypothesis. Um, I don't know if, if you can actually can you see my eye, my 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 pupil? You gotta go a little lower. Lower Move down a little. Yeah. Do you see a change there? It's also concerning. Oh yeah. Well, I mean. You see anything there? Maybe not. Yeah, it was also constricting a little bit. It also constricts. So that is what we call the consensual response. So that's it. It's actually important. Um, let's if we take a look here at this little video with his cartoon eyes. This guy is going to talk about an exam, and he's going to talk about stuff you don't need to worry about. Um, as well, but he does the stuff that you do need to worry about pretty well. Hi, a normal pupil examination can be documented as being pearl and no RAPD. This shorthand. So forget about the RAPD, the relative afferent pupillary defect. Don't worry about that part. Um, but you are going to worry about just watching how the pupils react and respond to the light, and not just the pupil that gets the light but the other pupil as well, the contralateral pupil. States that the pupils are equal and reactive to light and that there is no relative afferent pupil defect. So how do I actually test these properly? I ask the patient to fix in the distance, then I check the pupils are equal in size, and again with the lights off. Then with the lights still off, I check each eye has a direct response to light. Finally, I do a swinging light test to check there is no RAPD. Now, let's recap with a little more explanation. Firstly, to avoid the near reflex where the eyes converge, accommodate, and the pupils constrict, ask the patient to fix on an object in the distance. You should check the pupils are equal in both light and dark, or you may miss an abnormally small pupil, such as is seen in Horner syndrome. For more on unequal pupils, watch the video titled Anisochoria. Don't worry about it. When examining the pupil reactions, having the patient in the dark with distance fixation makes the pupils as large as possible and makes the pupil reactions easier to see. When you shine the light at the pupil, watch the same pupil for a quick constriction followed by a slight relaxation. So the main thing I want you to see here, when they, that arrow is representing the light, do you see how this little video shows the eye that he's shining the light in goes, but the other eye does the same thing? That's important. That's important to take home from this is that the eye that is getting the light is constricting, but the other eye is also constricting. Um, when you think about the, the way the eyes kind of go into the brain, like if this is the brain, the two hemispheres of the brain, this is your nose, these are your eyes. 
your pupils. We're gonna look at the way the eyes connect up a little more detail later, but the different fields of view are actually, like if this is the right-hand field of view, which is on one half of your retina, and you have the left hand, or that's the left hand, the right hand field of view, this is on this retina. Each eye actually sends information to both hemispheres. So like this hemisphere here, which is going to get information about this side of the world, is gonna get information from this eye, but also from this eye. And the other hemisphere, which is looking at the other side of the world, is getting information from both eyes as well, like the appropriate part of that retina that's responding to that half of the world. So you know, that's where you get the whole optic chiasma and stuff. But if you just think about this, and we're gonna look at this in more detail later, don't worry about the details now, but mainly what I want you to see is that, oh, each eyeball actually is sending um, axons into both sides of the brain, right? So when you just use one eye, you are actually sending strong, strong um, information into both halves. So it's not that shocking that the response is coming back um, bilaterally. You know, that's going to be different when we do like the ciliospinal reflex, where we are pinching. In fact, we can look at that. That's the next one. Yeah, so again, if you want, you can do this on a friend or somebody at home. Again, you don't have to record your data, but I recommend it's, it's cool to look at because if you're not as, if, if it's not something that's as familiar to you, then it'll be weird in a cool way when you look at it happen. Like it, I can intellectually tell you like, oh yeah, the other eye is gonna go down as well. But when you actually see it happening, it's, it's, it's weirder. All right. There is no need to look for a consensual reaction here. Yeah, Again, don't worry. He goes into lots of other stuff you don't need to care about. What you really care about is just what I said. The fact that there is both an ipsilaterally and a consensual contralateral response. Ciliospinal, this one is pinching. So what, what do you think is gonna be, what kind of a response do you think you're gonna have in, in response to a pinch out? Is that gonna be sympathetic or parasympathetic? Sympathetic. sympathetic. Probably sympathetic. So this one you scratch or pinch on the neck and you should, it's really hard to see, but you should see a response in your pupils. Um, her, this video of her doing it, you can't see anything. That's why I say, look in the mirror and do it on yourself and look really carefully, see if you can see some little change in your pupillary diameter. If it's sympathetic, what would you expect to find in terms of the change? Constriction of the pupils. I'm sorry, dilation of the pupils. Yeah, a little bit of dilation, it'll get a little wider. Um, and then try to see whether or not it's ipsilateral or both ipsy and contralateral. Give, uh, give you a hint, it's probably gonna be different than here. Uh, what time is it? We, okay, we're, okay. Actually, let, actually let's, let's do that, we have, we have time. So equilibrium and balance reflexes. So this I think is, it's as useful doing this part because it kind of shows you how sometimes lots of things work together for things that you might think are kind of simpler. But so let's talk briefly about kind of balance and your equilibrium reflexes. Right, so 
Again, the first part of this thing is going to be those visual things um, that you're basically going to look at the little videos and describe. This next part we're actually going to do as a group. Um, I think it'll be fun. Again, we're going to look at these in much more detail when we get to um, the ear. You know, the ear has hearing, but the ear has lots of things that help you deal with balance, which way is gravity, which way is my head spinning. Um, I should, so, so in an ear, you have two things that are going to be dealing with equilibrium. They're going to be the three semicircular canals. And the utricle and the saccule. So these are little sub parts of the inner ear that deal with equilibrium. And again, like I said, we're gonna look at these in more detail, but for right now, utricle and saccule, these like detect direction of gravity. You know, even with your eyes closed, you know which way is up and down because you have these little things with these little rocks that are getting pulled by gravity and sending messages to your brain. So the utricle and the saccule detect the direction of gravity. The semicircular canals detect rotation of head. You know, there's three of them because they can detect whether or not you know, it's like if you were an airplane, you could do roll, yaw, pitch, or you know, it says pitch, roll, or yaw. There's three axes that you can kind of rotate your head around. Um, so you have three semicircular canals to detect those three different kinds. Um, we'll talk more about these in the lecture when we get to the ear. But for right now, I just want to make sure that you realize that you have detectors that can detect the rotation of your head and that you can detect the direction of gravity. Um, and so the two things we're going to look at, one is going to be just static equilibrium. We're going to have somebody balancing. So does everybody have their lab, their lab notebook in front of them? So what I'm going to have you do is the part of the lab where you are going to actually stand up. In fact, if we go to the actual, um, let me get the actual thing. There it is. Share screen. All right, so this is everything that I've been talking about so far. The plantar reflex, you can watch that and describe it. Corneal reflex, you can watch that and describe that. Pupillary light reflex, watch that and describe that. Ciliospinal, look in a mirror and describe that. 2E. So part A, test of equilibrium and spatial orientation. So this is thinking, okay, we say, all right, we have these little detectors in our ear that are helping us keep our balance. Um, what other senses do you think are helping us keep our balance so we don't just like fall over when we're trying to stand up? Our eyes? 
you have so yeah eyes will probably be just what if you see the whole world start to tilt that's probably information that you need to make an adjustment what's another thing that helps with balance that we've already seen in the beginning of today reflexes yeah remember which reflex in particular is a useful one strength what's that strength I don't know if I heard that. Or I mean, stretch, what it's stretch reflexes. Yeah, the stretch reflexes, exactly. Remember we've talked about one of the roles they play is if you start kind of listing or you know, moving off, those muscles on that side are gonna stretch and there's gonna be this automatic reflex that kind of tightens them up and pulls them back. So you've got this idea of just balancing is not just like one sense working together to keep you standing up. Um, so for this one, we're going to actually get into little breakout rooms so people can actually do this together because you'll have to stand back from your screen a little bit because you have to stand up. But basically, it says, have the subject stand with feet together and arms outstretched. And then Test the first subject first with eyes open and then with eyes closed. You so see, you have to observe and record body sway and corrective motions required to maintain balance. So that means in your notebook, you're going to write down. You're going to either, it'll be the somebody on your Zoom screen. So you'll be, able, or it might be you, in which case you'll have to go back and write down what happened to yourself. Um, I want you in real time to, okay, they're standing with their arms out with both legs together with their eyes open and describe what you see that they have to do in order to kind of stand there and stay standing balanced. Then after you have written that down, have them shut their eyes and now stand there for another minute and see if there's anything different and write down what you notice for that. You know, then you're going to do it yet one more time. Test the subject with one foot only and then the other. So now they're just on one foot. Like their dominant leg, eyes open, eyes closed. Their other leg, eyes open and eyes closed. You know, I want you to record your observations. Right, so this this is just in your lab your lab manual. This is nothing new. This this should be already in your lab manual because you've been laying this out in there. Um, so does that make sense? What you guys are going to do over the next like fifteen minutes or so? You want us to get each person's data, or just one other person's data in the group? No, just just one person. Okay. In, yeah, just one person in your group. Yeah, you know, pick the person who's kind of probably got who's willing to do it and also can you know has some room to step back and stand and that you can, you know, you want to be kind of more you just kind of stand back to actually make it make it look good. But I yeah, I think it will be fun for you to actually just do this and and then discuss what you see. Um So let's let us do that. I'm going to do the breakout rooms again. I think we got it, everybody. All right. So hopefully that that was interesting. Was anybody surprised at all by the results on that one? John? Oh, I was just raising my hand. Yeah, I was I was really surprised at how dramatic it was. And it was only on like the fourth little scenario that we saw, you know, the results and everything up till then. Um, we had Michael balance and he barely, barely moved up until that point. And all of a sudden it's like all over. <laughs> really dramatic. Yeah, so... How about other other people? 
Yeah, I agree. Like definitely it was so much harder to balance with my eyes closed, especially on my non-dominant leg. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, when I first did this, I was shocked at how important your eyes are for staying balanced. It didn't, you know, I mean, now, like if, I, if you're doing yoga or something and they you know, fixate on a point and try to do some kind of a balanced pose, it's like, okay, eyes, important. It's not just all about what your body feels like because your eyes are, yeah, your eyes are part of part of it. Um, when my eyes were closed, like I rationally knew I was okay, but my I felt like I was like on the edge of a cliff for when my leg was up. It was like totally terrifying. Um, and what, but what, were the people who were observing you, did they, did they see you do anything like? Yeah, I started um, swaying a lot more and making larger adjustments. Yeah, so, yeah, so it was your, your balance, your balance was not as, it wasn't just didn't feel like you were like, it wasn't just scarier, but you were closer to falling over. Yeah. We also found it weird that like uh, I leaned towards the side of the leg that I was standing on. So on my right, when I was standing on my right leg, I leaned towards the right. Um, and you would think that you would lean towards like the left to compensate for the loss of that limb. And we were kind of observing that. Yeah, no, that, that I'm not sure. I'm not even sure if that would if everybody would have that exact same experience. Um, well, we did. And I think it's because your body is trying to get your you know, center of gravity back. And since you're on that, you know, your, say your left foot, you're going to lean to the left to try to, you know, rebalance yourself is what I would think. But in our group, we also found it interesting that um, she had better balance on her non-dominant foot. Oh, that's interesting. That, that's yeah. <laughs> really not as typical. Typically, your non-dominant isn't as just comfortable with things. It's not, also just not as strong as well, because I mean, part of it is just the strength of trying to make all those adjustments. So a another interesting reflex that has to do with balance and eyes that you probably aren't thinking about as much is just maintaining your gaze like staring at something because your head's moving around. Like right now, I, if I, if I want to be more dramatic, I'm staring right into my webcam. So my eyes should be looking straight at you. And now I'm going to move my head. I'm moving my head one way. I'm moving it the other way. I'm moving it down. I'm moving it up. If I, think I can take off these readers and that's even probably more dramatic. It's like in order for me to maintain my gaze right at you, my eyes are moving all over the place, right? If my head is going this direction, my eyes have to be rotating the opposite way in the sockets. If I'm going this way, the eyes are rotating the other way. If I'm going down, they got to be going up. If I'm going up, they got to be going down. So that's another reflex that is going where your little rotation detectors in your skull are feeding information into your brain that is going to operate your eye muscles to keep you staring straight at the same thing. So you, otherwise, if I move my head, my eyes would just go all over the place. But instead I can move my head and I can just keep staring at you all or staring at the webcam, I guess. Um, so does, does that make sense that this has to be a reflex? Mm -hmm. So it can be used actually in a neurological context, because if you fool those, those rotation detectors, those semicircular canals that we're gonna look at in more detail into thinking that you are spinning when you're not, you're still gonna have your eyes move if you're trying to stare straight ahead. So if you're trying to stare straight ahead and your head's turning, you're gonna to have to move your eyes to compensate, if you spin somebody around and get those fluids in the inner ear moving, and even if they're not moving, they feel like they're spinning, because, and we're gonna talk about this again more in lecture later, you actually, if they try to look straight ahead, if you, if you think you're spinning, but you're not, what are your eyes gonna do still? If your brain, if your brain thinks your, uh, your head is turning, 
and I want to keep they're staring. Gonna move around in the sockets. They're gonna have to, yeah. So if I am looking straight ahead and I think my head is going this way, my eyes are gonna have to go this way. So there's this word for it. It's called nystagmus. I mean, I'll do it later in reality. For right now, I'm just gonna show you a little video because it's just easier and looking at the time here. Um, so this is a totally goofy thing. This guy is being ridiculous, you know, with a helmet and blah, blah, blah. These guys are goofballs, but they show the basic idea. Nystagmus demonstration. We have Brian Shelley who's going to be spinning to the left to make himself dizzy. So as soon as he's kept himself up. So when you're doing this, you get the fluid in the semicircular canals kind of moving and it keeps moving. And so when you stop, it has this inertia. So the brain keeps getting this spinning. And actually, we'll talk about it. Basically, it feels like it's spinning even when you stop spinning. That's why you're dizzy. We'll talk about why you feel dizzy. But look look what happens to his eyeballs when he stops and just tries to stare straight ahead. As soon as he's done, we're going to videotape his eyeballs to see which way, once he has stopped, his nystagmus will be towards. So we win. No, he's kidding. Keep going. 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 Yeah, oh, man. oh man. It's fast to the right, isn't it? So could you can you see how his eyeballs were actually kind of going off? Kind of going boom, 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 boom. It's basically he thinks his head's moving, so his eyes have to move the other way, but then they kind of hit the end and it's like, wait, what's going on? Go back to the center, but no, actually, I still feel I'm moving. So you can actually induce this by just spinning around. You can induce it actually, it's called caloric nystagmus. You pour warm water in somebody's ear canal and that creates convection currents in the, um, in the fluids in the canals of the inner ear and will start your eyes flicking around. Um, so this is another reflex. So that is looked at this idea of nystagmus. If you, if your inner ear is fooled into thinking that you're rotating your head, you'll have these compensatory movements with your eyeballs where they'll move off to the side. And when they hit the edge, they'll kind of come back, but then move again. And that, that's called nice, that flickering of your eyeballs is nystagmus. So, um, in if, if you just spin around and then look in the mirror or just hold your head and look, try to look straight in somebody's eyes, they'll go, ooh, weird, as your eyeballs flick around, um, which is, is kind of cool. Um, Okie dokie. The last one. Right. Yeah. 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 You got yourself? Oh. Gag reflex. Um, what happens if you put your finger down your throat and kind of touch the mucosa on the back of your throat. You gag. You gag. It's a, <clears throat> um, that's a natural reflex. It's actually something they check. Um, doing this will make sure that certain cranial nerves are functioning properly. Um, you know, in a neurological exam, they don't try to make you actually barf all over the examiner. Instead, they more gently stroke the top of the back of the throat and look for the look for kind of a muscular retraction or response. Um, so you can watch, you can watch here as this dude. Back just a little bit, good, and it's going to gag you. It's a good gag. Okay. <laughs> Reflex action of going. Yeah. So good gag. <laughs> Um, but there actually there is there is a good response to that. If, again, if you don't have the appropriate response, then there's indication that there's some problems with particular cranial nerves. So that will be the last part of this lab. Will be just to um, describe what you see in that little video. So so in the write up for this reflex lab, you've got data. 
for part one, which now you can just finish up part one because you've got the data. Again, like I said, I'll say one more time, don't worry about calculating the angles because I did not give you the individual measurements and everything. So just use the angles that are given you here in this spreadsheet. Even though the procedure talks about measuring these lengths and using the arctan and all that, um, you're not doing that. You just have the angles pre-calculated pre for you. For all these demonstrations, you know, except for the ciliospinal, it's pretty much watching the videos and describing what you see, you know, and answering the questions in the lab notebook. Um, so it's clear that you've thought about kind of what's happening there and what are the implications. So, and it's, it's more like kind of a little tour. It's kind of like a, it's almost, almost more like a homework than a lab in some ways. It's, but it's making sure that you've looked at these and you've got a sense of them and what are normal responses, what are not normal responses. <laughs>